Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome Good evening. to our uh, contemporary service. Please stand up while we sing this first one, and the words are up on the screen, and join along with us.
with all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Session or vain appeal, but my 
sincerity. Be thou exalted. Be thou exalted, Jesus forever. Be thou exalted forever. Take a moment and let's greet each other. Well, good evening again. Hey, it's, uh, it's, it's a joy to be with you tonight. And I'm just so thankful that, uh, that I uh, have the opportunity to come and share a few words with you. And uh, I, won't, uh, I won't hint around that. At, um, my, uh, what kind of drives my joy tonight is um, I, uh, I'm thinking about unity. I'm thinking about the joy of uh, me being from, you know, that other church, having an opportunity to share here tonight. And it's not the first time that I've enjoyed just being together in worship. And, uh, and I'll mention a little bit later in some comments. But um, so I, I, I guess I'm not going to sneak up on you with this message of unity tonight. Uh, that's really kind of what, uh, what I want to talk about for a few minutes. And um, I actually was thinking about this back, uh, back at the time that we uh, were getting ready for our, uh, our, our second worship in the park this summer. Actually, it was actually the, turned out to be the first worship in the park. <laughs> but it was the second uh, 
planned worship in the park, and, uh, and I, uh, I just came up with a little chorus that I, I want to share with you, okay? But before I do that, let us just pause for a word of prayer. Dear God, uh, we thank you, Lord, for um, that through your Spirit, by your love, and uh, by your grace, we are able to come together tonight and be together. We're able to love one another, and we're able to just enjoy uh, worshiping together. So, Lord, I pray that that will be, above all, that which drives us. Uh, so may your Spirit lead us, and Lord, uh, speak through me or in spite of me, uh, words or a word that may be of benefit to someone tonight. And uh, we will all be careful to give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I have the words that I gave to Mark to, to put on the screen, or I gave to Jeremy, who gave them to Mark, right? Okay. It goes like this. We are one spirit. We have one Lord. We are one body of grace. We have one Father. One voice, one hope, one faith. Would you like to sing that with me? We have one spirit, we have one Lord, we are one body of grace. We have one Father, one voice, one hope, one faith. Let's sing it one more time. We have one Spirit, we have one Lord, we are one body of grace. We have one Father and one voice, one hope, one faith. You believe that? If you believe that, say amen. You may join me or lead, uh, as I lead in the scripture, just follow along. As I, as I uh, read from Ephesians chapter 4, I'm actually beginning with verse 4, and the words go like this. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And then we move to verse 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching 
and by the cunning and the craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So I'll I'll probably focus on a, a couple places in that text. We've already sung it, and I will stick with this. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And then there's another part of that uh, text kind of tucked in there. It says that as we grow in that unity, we become mature, attaining to, to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Well, summer is uh, over, right? Well, not quite. A few more days. When's fall begin? Uh, wh- the 23rd. Okay, so it's still summer. Well, for the most part, it seems like uh, it's over for me, but we've had a lot of good times this summer. Had a lot of family gatherings around uh, um, my family, and, and most of them seemed to be at our house, but that was okay. It's fun. Um, I know, that I, I, know the, that I look like I'm 31, but I actually... Um, I became a grandfather for the first time this summer, okay? So that was, that was June 30th, so that kind of brought a lot of people together, uh, not once, not twice, but a bunch of times, and then they had a couple birthdays tucked in there uh, throughout the summer. Uh, we had 4th of July, that's right. We had Father's Day before that, and... Um, And then I think we made up some holidays or made up some events to bring us together. It was our extended families. And um, I I use the term extended families, I suppose, a little bit loosely. Um, I think of the family members connected both to my side of the family and uh, my my wife's side of the family. My wife is Kim. She was a, a heart from Oil City. And um, oftentimes when my family would get together, the Hart family was there and vice versa. So it's kind of like these two two trees that grow together and then the branches start to kind of get all twisted together. And that's that's what our our families have become. And um, so collectively, we we have quite a a bunch of folks that... uh, uh, it's an interesting bunch. There's a quite a bit of diversity there. And um, there are old folks and there are young folks. Um, the ages range from about 11 weeks of age to 90. And uh, there are small people and there are large people. There are people that uh, are kind of quiet. And there are people that never quit talking. And... Um, there are people that don't eat very much, and there are others that are just eating all the time, all weekend long. And uh, actually, one of those is the same person that fits both of those categories, the talking and the eating. <laughs> it would not be unusual for us to have as many as a, a do- dozen different Christian denominations around the table when we gather. And the larger the gathering, the more diversity. We know which one to go to when we have a carpentry question. We know which one to go to when um, there's a, uh, a mechanical issue. And uh, my son-in-law lives in Pittsburgh, and uh, I picked up a part for him for a clothes dryer, and I said I'd, I'd call him to kind of walk him through how to, how to fix that. And interestingly, today I, I heard him inviting my son and his wife down to his place for dinner tomorrow night. 
my son's the, he's the creative mechanical one in the family. So I know what he's going to be doing after <laughs> dinner. <laughs> we have a doctor now and a, a, a physician's assistant and, so, and we have somebody that's a, that's a, uh, a counselor and you know, I, I know who to go to when I'm sick and when I need some counseling. So you get the point. There's a lot of differences, but although there's a lot of diversity, we have, I feel like we have more in common. Because at the center of all that is, a, is this kind of a nuclear family that, that just kind of drives it all. And... Um, Somewhere in the blending of everything, that, that, that family name has become the identifying factor. And all the differences don't really matter. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the letter that I wrote, um, he is telling the folks that he writes to about their identity. And uh, in reading through today's text, um, I, I find that unlike a lot of times when Paul was writing to churches, there's usually some kind of a problem that he's trying to address in the church. There's some kind of a, 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 of a heresy that he's trying to dispel, or there's, there's some, kind of a, some kind of an issue that he feels like he has to uh, take care of with the letter. And that, that doesn't seem to be the case so much with the uh, church at Ephesus, However, there does seem to be a different kind of a conflict taking place in the church at Ephesus. And the conflict is not so much against flesh and blood, and it's, it's not so much against or, or about the people in the church not getting along, um, but it's about this battle uh, that's this taking place in the universe. He talks a lot in Ephesus about the spiritual forces uh, in the world and in the universe, and, and, and he addresses that in his letter. It seems like the instances of friction that had troubled other churches that Paul wrote to, they had, they, uh, they had died down in Ephesus, but in the larger spiritual universe, darkness was present. And the Christians at Ephesus, in particular, and others that this circular letter would end up being read to, they had a role to play in this universal battle that was taking place. It's a battle that was not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of darkness. In this big picture, God's intention was for the church to come together as a family and put aside differences that divided them and be the means by which God would display. And here's the term that I went back to, and I said this was one that's tucked in there that just kind of jumped out to me. The church was the means by which God would display the fullness of Christ to the world. Do you know that apart from the fullness of Christ, that um, governments around the world are crumbling? Apart from the fullness of Christ, cultures are collapsing. And our world is really entering into some dark times. Do you know, apart from the fullness of Christ, there are families throughout our region that are falling apart as well. And even in Franklin, there are many that need to know the fullness of Christ. They need to know the fullness of Christ. So, in our text that Paul shares with us, he opens up the minds of the readers to how this works. Here's how it works. He says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But it's interesting, he starts and says, there's one body, there's one spirit. As one with a little bit of experience with, with families, 
I'd like to just kind of speak to us as a family because I really feel like um, I really feel like I'm part of your family. I really do. And that means a lot to me, and I shared that earlier. And as I shared also, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of this thing of unity. One body, one spirit, one hope, one faith. Paul talks very frequently about unity in his letters. I, I think that there's a case that could be made that about all of his letters, at the heart of them, is his uh, desire for unity in the church. There are a number of things that I could circle in, even in this small text tonight, but I just want to circle one, and that's unity. Surprise, surprise. But first, let me ask um, a couple questions. Do you suppose that unity is something to seek or something to celebrate? Just think on that for a moment. Is, is unity, and we think about uh, the Christian community at large, and we have multiple churches here in the city of Franklin, and uh, uh, so that's kind of like a, maybe a macro look at, uh, at uh, this one body, and then we have what we have been spending time on culturing over the last few years, the Christ Church and First Church. Do you uh, think that Unity is something to seek or something to celebrate? And then I'll follow up with this question. Is unity a goal or is it a gift? Is unity a goal or is it a gift? Well, let me give you my take on that. I think when we focus on unity as a goal we tend to lower our sights to the lowest common denominator. And we start to settle for things that are really kind of superficial and, and those that barely convince us, let alone others, that it's, it's really unity. But when we look at unity as a gift, we look for the best. For God has His best in mind for us. He really does. In the Gospel of John, many of you are familiar with this text, Jesus is, uh, it's, it's the long prayer that he prays after, after his last supper with disciples. And in that prayer, he prays, Lord, my prayer is not for them, his disciples, not for them alone, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Folks, I have read this passage over and over and over again, and I take from it that Jesus is referring to a unity that he has already given them, and he's not praying that they will somehow find it. He's praying that they will keep it. So I ask, is unity a concept we look forward to someday? Or is it an attitude which defines what God has already given to the church today? I think there was a... I've always been, I've always been a pretty um, ecumenical-minded, I think, and... Uh, terms of trying to bring churches together to worship. And um, what I like about what we've been doing together over the last few years, we being Christ and First Church, is it, it's, it's a way to really kind of narrow the focus down and, and I think do some meaningful things that you don't get so spread out that you can't do anything, you know. And uh, so I've really enjoyed the focus that we've had so I've always been mindful of the need to be uh, um, broad in thinking in terms of unity. But, um, and probably there was a time that it was more of a goal to me, kind of something to be striving for, but I don't think that way so much, particularly after I explored John 17. I, I think uh, 
Christ has brought us together. And then in a moment, I'm just going to share another scripture that I think emphasizes that. It's not just a goal, it's a gift from God. When we spend all of our time trying to create unity or try to find it, we focus too much on people and we set ourselves up for disappointment because people will disappoint no matter, no matter uh, how well we try to make it work. But when we look at unity as a gift, we can direct our attention to the giver, who is Christ. Unity is not a substitute for our focus as a church. It is the consequence of our focus on Christ. The unity is not just to be sought. It is to be celebrated. Recently, I was reading... Um, an article by a man named Dr. M. R. D. Hahn. Does that name ring a bell? M. R. D. Hahn was a medical doctor turned Bible teacher. And he went on to found the radio Bible class program. It originated in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And then he later introduced the world to the monthly devotional booklet, Our Daily Bread. That's M.R. Dehan. Dehan once said this. He, he said, every born-again believer is a member of that body of Christ and lives the common life of every other member by the one thing which unites them and makes them relatives, brothers, and sisters. That is the blood of Christ. I would never disregard the fact that we as a church are always a work in progress. But I will contend that as a gift of God, unity is ours to celebrate. It really is. So let me just kind of wrap this up with a with a few examples that I think we could all relate to. Uh, I mentioned the, uh, the uh, worship times together this summer. Um, those were very special to me. And I tell you, one of the, one of the most uh, special uh, worship services that I have participated in in the last 10 years was... Um, I guess it was three years ago on January 1, uh, our churches worshiped together here. That was just a very special time for me, and, uh, and uh, that was a time that I, I, just, I just celebrated, that God, God loves his people, and uh, he loves to see us worship together, and I, and I thanked him for that. But we've done a number of, uh, I think, kind of fun things, a little bit... Um, challenging at times, right, Jeremy, but fun things in uh, bringing the churches together in the last couple years, and then this summer, as I mentioned, we worship twice, and uh, next Sunday, there's going to be a tailgate party in the parking lot, and don't tell Jeff, but we're probably going to use his house, too, and uh, we're going to celebrate together. Uh, around a football game and food and uh, the love of Christ. Um, they've been good times. We've, uh, we've sung together. We've played together. We've, um, I believe we've grown together. We've rung bells together. And that's just a wonderful joy I've had. And one of these days, we're going to get that bell choir rolling again there. <laughs> Heidi, um, we will. Remember, if we keep thinking of unity in the Christian family at large as a goal, um, we might miss out on what God's doing. But if we, and if we keep thinking of unity as a, as a goal for us as two churches, um, again, we may miss out on the gift that God's already blessed us with. So, so 
hey, come to the times that we're able to worship together and uh, come to the tailgate party. I'm going to try to get there if I'm not too worn out from a pretty busy weekend. But uh, come and celebrate. Uh, Don't be looking for, you know, is this going to work? But let's just celebrate the opportunity when God gives it. The Apostle Paul, here's what he says about you, me, and all the people that he wrote to. He said, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He writes that in Galatians 3.28. I had a New Testament professor that he, he would say this about, his, uh, about Paul's theology. He said to the Apostle Paul, there were only two kinds of people. It was either those that had been covered by the blood of Christ or those that weren't. It's just two kinds. That's why Paul, more than once, would say, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither male nor female, we are all one in the body of Christ because of what Christ did. You see, the unity in Christ is not about what we like, it's not about who we are so much, but about what God has done. And here's what God has done. Through sending his son, he reconciled you to himself. He gave that opportunity for everyone to be reconciled to himself. He talks about that in the second chapter of Ephesians that we didn't read. But he also says that uh, he has reconciled those that are saved. He's reconciled them to one another. That's why he says there's neither Jew nor Greek because it didn't matter how good the Jews kept the law, they still failed. And it didn't matter how much the Greeks tried to avoid the law, they were all the same in need of Christ. So sisters and brothers, God has reconciled you to himself through Jesus. He's reconciled us to one another. But he did something even beyond reconciling us to God and reconciling us to one another. He has united those reconciled people into one body, the church. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body. It's a mystery, but that's what God has done And he's made us all part of one body. That chorus that we sang earlier, I actually wrote a couple verses, and let me just share the words to those verses because the the words came out of this theology of Paul and the reconciliation that takes place. And the the words go like this, Lord, and I I, I trust that, uh, that you would appreciate these words as well. They say, Lord, we thank you for giving us your Son, for the blood he shed, the gift he gave, so we could be made one. Now we are a family, and together we will be a people who keep the unity. Lord, we praise you for taking all of our shame and now in one accord, together, we'll bring honor to your name. No more walls, no more chains, all divisions gone away. One bond in Christ we celebrate. God has done something great 
for those that he loves and knows that he has saved through Jesus Christ. And he's broken down the barriers. He has ripped away the chains. He has taken away the dividing walls. So, my closing comment is this. God has united those reconciled individuals into one body, the church. And you know, I mentioned earlier that there are many that need to know the fullness of Christ. Many just right down the street and up the street and that way and that way. They need to know the fullness of Christ. If the church, if the church cannot be the unifying force in a world that needs to see and know the fullness of Christ, beginning with the city of Franklin, and maybe even beginning with our churches. I, I won't go that far, but if there are people that need to know the fullness of Christ, if the church cannot be that unifying force, then, then who is really left to do it? Who's left to do it? Let's pray. Dear God, we do thank you for giving us your son. We thank you for the blood shed so all of us could be reconciled to you. We thank you, Lord, that in doing that, you reconciled us to one another. And thank you for putting us into a church that we call a body. Help us, Lord, to always find ways that we can, we can support one another and encourage one another to grow. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you above all. And Lord, for those that need to know the fullness of Christ, May they see a church that loves them, a church that cares for one another, and a church that cares for them. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Fail and fear 
surrounds me. You never fail, and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger. Set your 
church on fire, witness nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Unleash your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far. Force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church. We are the hope. Your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, hear our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here.
are the brightest, you will lead us through the storms. Fire before us, you are the brightest, you will lead us through the storms. Fire before us, you are the brightest, you will lead us through the storms. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shine me in the darkness. I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore. As we close, I, I want to I share a word of thanks for um, allowing Pastor Jeff to, to be of so much help to, uh, to, to me and Christ Church in the last couple of weeks. Many of you know that Pastor David uh, Jance uh, ended up with surgery that was uh, kind of anticipated but not planned that soon. And as a matter of fact, uh, when they, they scheduled his surgery, just uh, gave him uh, about three days to uh, prepare for it, and it happened to be right in the middle of the week that I was already scheduled to be away on vacation. So uh, we're thankful for Jeff that uh, provided some pastoral care to the folks of Christ Church, and uh, he has just been such a, just a wonderful joy to work with. And uh, Pastor Dave is coming along pretty well. Uh, there's a blog on the Christ Church website, ChristChurchFranklin.com, that kind of spells out, he's chronicling it for people to... So you can be updated on how he's doing. But he's, he's doing um, a little bit better, a lot of pain. Uh, the energy level is pretty low, and he's uh, just trying to get himself built back up. But uh, continue to remember David in prayer. If you would, I'd appreciate that. So uh, let us stand together as we uh, conclude our, our time tonight. May the grace of God and the love of Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit bless you tonight in your ministry ahead in the days of your lives so that together we can be the church, the lighthouse that reaches out with the kingdom of God to a world that needs to know the fullness of Christ. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you. Good. It was a joy to be here.